it's crazy, but it's You're watching so Channel Z, the world's leading zombie apocalypse channel. It's something broadcasting live from Studio Z. Makes me act the way I do. Welcome to The Other Side, a friendly debate show about controversial topics. I'm Athena Actipus, and I'm here with my co-host, Rob Dunn. Hey, Athena. I'm ex super excited about today's show. I am so excited, too. We're going to talk about a topic that is really close to our hearts, education. Um, you know, as a mom and as an educator, I think a lot about education. And um, today we're going to talk about if we're doing education right. Are we actually educating kids in a way that makes sense so that they can deal with the challenges of the present, challenges of the future, and uh, especially the zombie apocalypse? Yeah, I'm really excited about part two because in this weird year, everybody's had to cope with what kind of education should one have? How does one do it at home? How do we think through all these challenges? And and so I think it's timely to, re to really start to talk about what do we know about education theory and what works best? Yeah, I, I personally have gone through a huge transition in terms of educating my kids because so I have an eight-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 15-year-old. Um, they all went to online school at the beginning of the pandemic. And then over the course of the last six months, both my 13-year-old and 15-year-old have shifted to self-directed learning or what some people call unschooling. Um, and honestly, it's something I never would have considered if it weren't for the pandemic and you know having them be an online school, seeing what that was like for them and seeing how it wasn't working for my two older kids, but for really different reasons. So, so how do you think self-directed learning relates to paleo learning? Yeah. Is so it, is, it, is it some kind of impersonation thereof? That's a great question. And yeah, so our show today is about public school versus paleo school. And some of you might be wondering, well, you know, what is paleo school? And, you know, loosely defined, it's kind of this idea of, you know, how do we educate kids in a way that is kind of consistent with the, um, the way that learning works for humans as a species, like what's the point of it um, and how does it actually function? And um, so if we're talking about that in the context of small scale societies, right, we see kids learn um, often without any, um, uh, any instruction in the sense of like, there's not, you know, formal lessons, it's much more informal. Um, and, you know, self-directed learning is also sort of about just learning from the world around you. So I think, you know, in some ways, self-directed learning maps on to a lot of um, the same kinds of ideas as, uh, as you know, paleo school. I, I think that we're biased, too, in the sense that as scientists, like our job is kind of to do self-directed learning, right? So we're supposed to hold stuff up and learn about it until uh, we become obsessed and then we're praised for that. And so, you know, maybe, maybe we're... Uh, we should get the experts in, I think. I think we should definitely get the experts in. So um, our first expert today, um, well, first of all, we'll be talking with um, John Rudolph. Um, and John is an education expert. Um, John, welcome to The Other Side. It is a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit about your background. Um, can you tell us, like, how did you start studying education? And, um, and, and what do you think of this question? you know, of paleo school versus public school? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, Athena and, and Rob, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, so I, I, um, I began as a, as a high school science teacher, middle school and high school science teacher way back. And uh, that was my most my career goal. And, and as I started doing that for a few years, I, I became interested in, in these larger questions of, of how, like, what should we be teaching? And how should we learn science? And, and I got really interested in using the history of science, sort of a humanistic approach to learning science. And so I, I went back to grad school and, and got graduate degrees in history of science and, and science education and uh, went back, taught school for a little longer, then ended up as a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin. And that's where I am now. And I study the, the history of science education. Um, I, I run a science teacher education program at Wisconsin and, uh, and I'm looking at science education policy questions. And the, the paleo traditional, you know, as you were talking, Athena, uh, that question, you, you were talking about those as a means, like what's more effective, paleo or traditional? And I guess the question that I've 
or the answers that I've come up with is is you can't think about means without thinking about the ends or the purposes. And, and I think that that that's the larger question that that needs to be asked, mm. really. Yeah. So, what is the the end? You know, what's the point of education? Well, I mean, I think that there's there's certainly the a variety of goals. Like right now, the way traditional schooling is set up, it's it's sort of a credential system where it's all about social mobility, getting people into the schools they want to go into, so that they can get the careers and jobs and and that sort of workforce training uh, purpose. Um, you know, other goals in the past have been more humanistic, uh, democratic uh, participation, cultural appreciation. Um, sort of utilitarian things, you know, especially in science education, that's how it came in was that was useful knowledge. Um, but that's not how kids learn it in schools. Now they learn things in science to pass a test uh, that they never use in their lives. And I, I've had two girls go through high school recently and, and they would come home and say, why do I have to learn this? Like, and as an educator, it's, it was a challenge because on the one hand, I'd want to say, yeah, you're never going to need this. But on the as a parent side of it is, well, no, I want you to get into a good college. So you need to do well in your chemistry and physics classes. And so it's those purposes that are always in conflict with one another. So what, what, what's the ideal purpose? Or, go ahead, Tina. Yeah, well, a similar question, but bringing it back to, you know, this issue of, you know, well, what is the point of learning all this stuff, right? I mean, yeah, there's getting a good job. Um, there's, you know, being a good citizen. But there's also the question of, you know, how are we as humans going to survive the zombie apocalypse? And, you know, like, can we do that if people um, are are not <coughs> learning about how the world works? Um, you know, wh what knowledge is necessary to, to have have to deal with the the challenges, you know, whether we want to think about apocalyptic issues like you know climate change, um, if we want to talk about you know apocalyptic issues in politics, right? There's so many ways that um, our our human world that we have constructed is vulnerable, and you know, at least personally, I think a lot about like, well, what what do people, what do students? What do kids need to learn now so that they can deal with the the crisis the crises that are going to be happening in the future? Yeah, I, I, the the question is when I mean, you talk about the the zombie apocalypse, uh, you know, that that this makes a difference whether there's an existing civilization that we're trying to educate students for or not. I mean, so in this in this uh, other world of of, of an a post apocalyptic world you know, then the knowledge that's valuable is the things that are useful, right? How to, how to uh, avoid infections, what plants are edible, how do you survive? And this is knowledge that has real use value. Um, but if we're thinking about some existing civilization that's still there, then, then there's knowledge that, like, how do these systems work? What does it mean to be a participant in the civilization? Um, I mean, those are, those are different kinds of, different kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. We have some um, great coming um, qu questions and comments coming in um, from the audience um, right now. This is my favorite. Um, uh, sorry, Neil asks, which of your kids would make your zombie apocalypse team? Um, so, uh, Rob, actually, do you want to do you want to take that one first, and then um, John, if you want to, you can. <laughs> oh yeah. So one of my kids is very academic, and so she, she's wonderful and knows all about the world, but. It, like practical stuff, not so much. And and so it, probably I'd pick my son who can figure stuff out and like knows which bird species are which and knows which things you can eat. Um, I'd want them both ideally though, but if I've got to pick one to be on the team for making it through, uh, yeah, he's probably the one. How about you, John? Yeah, I guess my, my girls are pretty good with sort of their street smarts. Uh, and surviving in the, the sort of socio social economic world that they're in right now. Um, they, they really had a struggled with school in terms of sort of the, the traditional academic subjects and, and mostly because like they didn't see the point. Um, so I guess I would say that same. Oh, in, in that light, I'll jump back in because if there's socio-political struggle, my daughter's on my team for sure. Like that, yeah. By, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, all of these things become important when we start thinking about, you know, like, how do we as humans make it in an uncertain world? And it's not just a matter of, you know, if you can rub flint and steel together and get a spark, right? Um, you know, we, as humans, we rely on other humans so much, um, not just, you know, for skills, but also for knowledge. And, you know, in a lot of ways, that's kind of, that's kind of what we're talking about with education is, you know, how do we as humans fundamentally rely on other humans? humans um, for information that can that can help us survive. Are you trying to avoid picking, Athena? I think you have to also pick. <laughs> I have to pick, yeah. Um, well, so I think each of my kids has redeeming qualities that could help them in the zombie apocalypse. Um, my youngest, my eight-year-old, is willing to eat almost anything. So I think, you know, it wouldn't be much of a burden, even though he's a little bit smaller, because he would just, uh, you know, forage for himself. Um, my 13-year-old my um, likes to blow things up and um, is into engineering. So I think those could potentially both be useful skills. Um, Great and skills. Yeah, and my 15-year-old, um, she's excellent at telling stories. Um, she also has film editing skills. I'm not sure how useful those would be. It depends on what kind of zombie apocalypse yeah. we're in. Um, but yeah, um, now, uh, yeah, Pam is saying that I'm being very diplomatic. And um, Alan Kugel has another suggestion here, which is a oh, little bit less tasteful, um, so to speak. Uh, so, um, and Alana is saying she's going to choose both of her boys. So yeah, I think, you know, we, 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 we have to... I think, look at this, the strengths that each child could bring to the table in the zombie apocalypse. Um, Rob, what do you say we uh, we bring on our next guest? Um, yeah, I think that's great. I think that's great. Let's do it. Excellent. All right. Um, our next guest is um, Meredith Small. Meredith is an anthropologist and an author. And um, Meredith, I'll let you introduce yourself a, a little bit more. Um, we'd love to hear about your your background and how you got into this topic of education. I actually, I'm an anthropologist, a biological anthropologist, uh, Professor Emerita from Cornell, and now a visiting scholar in the anthropology department at Penn. So I have a background as a primatologist. And then I learned about some incredible research about uh, anthropologists and calling themselves ethnopediatricians working on babies. And I am the author of the book, Our Babies Ourselves, How Biology and Culture Shape the Way We Parent, and Kids, How Biology and Culture Shape the Way We Raise Our Children. Mm -hmm. And the point of both those books is really that we can look at children, babies, education, everything that have to do with kids, we can look at them in a framework that is both evolutionary in the sense when you're talking about the paleo education, how are humans designed and how they got to be that way. And then also most importantly to me, cross-culturally, that every single culture has a belief system and they educate their children within that belief system so that they bring up good citizens. And the question is how, how we do that in Western culture, how we do that after the apocalypse is going to be affected by what the goals of whatever small group that we belong to after the apocalypse. And as far as I can tell, living in this mini apocalypse that, that we're in right now with the pandemic, what I see in Western culture is an incredible lack of critical thinking in terms of how people are brought up. And I'm speaking specifically about conspiracy theories, about not, you know, not believing the election was won, being afraid of the viruses. And what you hear from these people, if you really listen, those who are so frightened, is that they were never given the tools. People talk about science, but what they really mean is the scientific method and why the scientific method, method specifically answers questions to the best of our ability. And I think that's really lacking right now. And it's also different from Europe where people get very good scientific method um, approaches. So I think we need to discuss where we get an education for critical thinking in this, in this, in Western culture, how we beef that up before the apocalypse comes. Yeah, so Meredith, what does it look like in small scale societies in terms of the the way that kids learn and um, sort of, you know, go through that developmental process from, you know, infanthood to adolescence and then and then adulthood? It, most Westerners believe that everybody in the world is just like them. 
But in fact, there are still many hunting and gathering societies. There are also many societies that are what anthropologists call small plot horticulturalists. In other words, they have a little bit of land, they grow things, they sometimes grow them cooperatively, they eat that the food, they might sell it. There are also uh, cultures that maintain that small plot thing, but then people go out and earn money by working on coffee farms or whatever. In these cases, the kids are deeply integrated into the society. And instead of going to school, that is a separate building somewhere else, they're just part of daily life. And one thing that's really important to know is that around the world right now, 90% of childcare is done by children not by adults. So if you've gone to another culture, a non-Western culture, you see a 10-year-old carrying around a three-year-old and Westerners are often shocked. But these kids are really great babysitters. There's usually some adult around. And so we have an assumption in the West that the older people must teach the younger people. But in other cultures, other kids are teaching them. And the idea of the one room schoolhouse that we used to have in Western culture, that's actually a really good thing. Kids really learn from other kids. And it's a system, that's why the playground can be a really great place. Or play dates with kids of varying age, not everybody together in the same age. Kids also learn by doing in a practical sense, helping with the weeding, helping with the harvesting, helping with the daycare. So Meredith, are there, are there ways, so, so do, you, do you think that that sort of learning approach should be brought more into the, into the US system, for example, and are there ways to scale it up? Can we imagine totally rethinking what we're doing with, with education, especially I think in the context of the zombie apocalypse or just more generally, the reality that we're moving into a rapidly changing world right. where what was useful 10 years ago may no longer be what's useful in 10 years. Uh, if how, how do we, we do all this? Is there a way forward? Well, if I were secretary of education, the first thing I would do is make multiple age classrooms. I, wow. I would put, you know, kindergartners, first and second graders together. And then, you know, you'd have to have more classrooms to do that. That's the first thing I would do. And um, I think basically publication, uh, publication is really great. And the more kids go on field trips, the more they have time to make things. Like I, I remember when my kid was in second grade, they actually made electrical things. And my daughter had to do something where she plugged in a battery to a potato and watched something happen, and the teacher said, now don't put it in the water. So my daughter immediately shoved it in the water. And when I asked her why, she said, I wanted to see if it would work. And the good news is she didn't get in trouble for that. And I think that kind of education where you let kids explore as long as they're safe can be really useful and also helps a kid feel like, you know, this was fun, they accomplished something, and they'll learn something. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it reminds me of, um, at least in the Montessori model, right, they have these multiple age classrooms. And so it's a mm -hmm. sort of, you know, lots of sort of free exploration. Do you think that gets a little bit closer to you know, your sort of ideal of what education should look like? Well, <laughs> there, there, it, among anthropologists who study things like education, there's this joke that if you want uh, to follow something that happens in Italy, you want to do the cooking, but maybe you don't, you want to get your education from there. Um, the Montessori, what I know of Montessori also has particular boundaries. And um, I didn't send my daughter there because I didn't agree with their, it's actually a very, it's much more structured than people think. And I thought it was too structured actually. And that public school gave my daughter more opportunities for interacting with all kinds of kids, which is the, the social part of going to school, especially because the biggest change we have in most Western culture compared to other non-Western cultures is a very low birth rate. And we are constantly struggling to give our kids interaction with other kids and not kids that look exactly like them, all kinds of kids. 
And to me, that is the, be the two things we can give our kids for the apocalypse, critical thinking and social skills with all kinds of people. Those to me are survival skills. Meredith, is, is there a, uh, a place that you think is a model for doing that well? I mean, if we're not looking to Italy, where do we, where do we look to? I don't know. That's a really good question. Uh, I real. I don't. Anybody else have the answer, John? Do you know? It sounds like it sounds like the Dewey School back in the late eighteen hundreds at Chicago. Oh, there we go. You tell us more about that, John. Well, so John Dewey, you know, famous philosopher and and uh, pedagogue, was uh, came over to the University of Chicago in eighteen ninety four, and and he established. So he he was a big advocate of teaching. Uh, critical thinking, the scientific method, uh, the idea that that you learn from the consequences of your experiences, right? He had a famous book, Experience in Education. And so he set up the Dewey School, um, which was an elementary school, sort of a multi-age group kind of situation where the students did these kinds of hands-on social interactions. He talked about the school being an embryonic community. So the social aspects were really important. Oh, that's, a, that's great. And, and the... Um, and the the experience a lot of times it was talked about as hands-on learning but that's a little oversimplification of what dewey was about um but it, it was it was he was against dichotomy so it wasn't just hands-on on one side and the academic uh subject matter knowledge on the other it was how do we join these things together how do we move from initial interest and innate experiences to sort of this formalized uh structural knowledge we have about the world and, and his Dewey School is an experiment. It was a laboratory school in trying to accomplish that. Yeah. Great. That's great. Yeah. Let's um, bring on our, our our final guests so that we can all um, talk together about these these questions. So our our last um, guest is Kevin Curry Knight, who is an unschooling researcher. Um, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us here on Undead Live. Uh, I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about your background and um, how you came to study education and what maybe your experience has been, um, sure. you know, with uh, self-directed education. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you both um, for having me on. And it's uh, also really good to be with the guests, John and Meredith. Um, so currently I'm a teaching associate professor at East Carolina University in their College of Education. Uh, I guess I'm by training, I'm a philosopher slash historian of education. And I really came across self-directed education. It wasn't my main area of research at all. It was, um, I was teaching a college class and I was realizing that my students were doing the kind of typical thing of kind of playing school like a game. Like the questions you would always hear is, is this gonna be on the test? Uh, if I was getting ready to go from one slide to another, uh, students would raise their hand and I'd say, oh, cool, they're gonna, we're going to get into a discussion. They're going to have a really great question. And um, they say, can you keep on that slide for a second? Because I want to write everything down so that, you know, when the test comes, you know, stuff like that. And I'm not one to try to, you know, blame students. So my initial thought is like, well, what's going on? And I started researching some things and even realizing, because my class is actually a class about learning and the science of learning and, and things, I was really looking at some of the research we were looking at, like the importance of uh, autonomy and choice in learning and uh, the generally negative influence of learning for grades and realizing that I was teaching my students one thing and doing another thing. So, you know, I was saying, here's some research on the importance of intrinsic motivation and here's a lecture about it. Make sure you remember it because it's going to be on the next test, which is worth 20% of your grade uh, and realizing that that was kind of a contradiction. So I started revising my class bit by bit by bit, allowing them certain aspects of choice, like choose how you're going to demonstrate mastery on this next assignment, getting pretty good results with that and being like, okay, well, maybe I'm still constricting them too much. Maybe I should go to the next phase. Like choose what you're going to learn based on our course goals and objectives. Like you'll have, you know, a lot for your choice and, and that got good results. And then at some point it occurred to me that I really, if I'm going to let them choose their projects and things, I'm going to have to let go of the grading practices. I'm going to have to give them a lot of control over their grade. And that was when I just started thinking this could go really bad, right? This, this, this could, this could end this whole experiment. And I did it. Um, 
and it actually went really well. I've had two researchers in my room actually uh, in my in this class for the last you know what two and a half years studying what it looks like, uh, and they kind of agree. They say that the kids in the class are doing at least as much work as they do do in other classes. And we're even hearing them say, I have to pull myself away from this class's project in order to do other classes projects because my class, they get to choose what they're going to do. Anyway, that's kind of professionally how I came across self-directed learning. And I've been into looking at research on it and producing my own writings on it ever since. And Kevin, what was your experience, you know, as someone growing up with education and did that influence sort of where, where you're at now? Yeah, this is the other interesting part. I didn't really think there was a connection between my own school experience and my discovery of self-directed learning until I, I really thought about it. In fact, a student brought this to my attention. I was talking to my students about my educational background and they're like, do you, do you think maybe that influenced kind of the direction you're going? Well, okay. So I was an average to below average student my whole entire school career. And I did the same thing that most kids do. If you look at surveys, uh, elementary schoolers usually kind of like school, dips about third grade when testing is introduced, middle school, it's lower, high school, it gets low, really low, almost to the point of like 20% satisfaction. Um, and I was one of those really unsatisfied kids. And my parents remind me, um, they gave up on getting me to try to do homework in middle school because it was just impossible. I just would not do it. Um, so in high school, I almost dropped out of school my junior year because they were going to hold me back because I had skipped so much school. I recently got my transcripts from my high school just to look at them because I'm starting to write an education memoir on this. And I had, I think, like a 1.4 or so GPA um, and I skipped or missed, I guess, 41 and a half days of school my junior year. So that's a pretty sizable amount. And my parents gave me an ultimatum. They said, like, if you don't finish school, we won't, you know, financially support you. You'll have to go get a job and kind of move out and all that. I wasn't prepared to do that. So I stayed in school. I graduated uh, with a very low GPA. I went to a music college, Berkeley College of Music, um, because that's the only kind of thing I wanted to do. That's the only thing in school that I enjoyed was music. And to give you an idea of how bad a student I was, it was a music college and they put me on extreme academic probation. Like if you don't pull this high GPA by the end of your first semester, you're out. Like we like your, your musical skills. We hate your grades. Uh, so I did that. Anyway, after school, I went to Nashville to become a songwriter because that's the career I saw myself having. And I worked in a bookstore. And I was charged with taking ownership of the philosophy department, like the philosophy section, the psychology section, sociology, a little bit of fiction. And this bookstore had a program where you could, quote unquote, check out any hardcover book as long as you brought it back in like two weeks. And you can only look at a section so much before you start saying, wow, that title looks interesting. Maybe I should just pick it up and skim through it. And I started doing that with philosophy books. Like I remember one of the first books I picked up was Albert Camus' Myth of Sisyphus. Um, and I knew that I didn't really understand it when I took it home, but I kind of knew that there was something interesting that I'm missing. I'm just missing something. I, I just have to start trying harder. And so I brought more books home and I worked my way through them. And that led to like curiosity about biology and curiosity about like sociology and all this other stuff. And by the time, at some point, I realized I'm reading some of the books now as an early 20-something by choice that I avoided deliberately when I was in high school. So one of the books that I remember vividly was The Scarlet Letter. Uh, at some point, I got into American history and the transcendental movement, and everyone says you can't understand transcendentalism without Hawthorne. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to read The Scarlet Letter. And at some point, it dawned on me, I'm reading this book, and I remember in my, it must have been my sophomore year, avoiding the, reading this book, even though we were assigned it. And I would do everything possible to like cheat my way through. And here I am reading this book and actually paying attention to it in my early well, 20s. Well, and the reason that you were paying attention to it is because it was relevant to That's you, right. right? Because of like, you were thinking about that broader context. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. And it kind of, you know, brings up these issues, right, of how, you know, in order for things to be inherently interesting, um, there there has to be some other background, some other context on which um, that interest can emerge. 
Yeah, that's so uh, John alluded before to the Dewey School um, and Meredith alluded to Montessori. And both of those models are interesting in, in that they give students a bit more freedom than they would they get in other systems. But one of the problems, especially with Dewey, and it's even evident in Montessori, is they operate on what I, I don't know the, if there's a good term for it, what I call the sales pitch model of interest, which is especially Dewey in his book, uh, I, I think it's interest and effort, if that's right, John. Uh, it's it's either interest and effort or effort and interest. I don't recall uh, what the title yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. It, so he talks about this idea that there are things that are just valuable for everyone to know. And what we have to do is, to do his credit, he realized that we have to get students interested. He was really one of the first people to push this idea and push it and push it that if a student is not interested, the learning will either not happen or will be subpar. And good for him, but you have this tension. On one hand, students have to be interested. On the other hand, there is this stuff that just is valuable that students need to know and we need to teach them. So what he did is basically implied that the good teacher will be able to craft a sales pitch for all of these things that we need to know mm -hmm. that will reach students where they are in their in their daily lives and that will connect it to daily life. And if if we just try hard enough, those sales pitches will result in the interest that will spark the learning. And not only does that, does that put teachers in an extraordinarily difficult situation, because if you have 30 students per class, however, however many classes a day, you have 30 students for which you have to craft these sales pitches, that can be pretty tough. Um, and of course, the assumption is for every lesson you teach, there will be some sort of sales pitch that if you try hard enough, uh, you can get students to learn. Um, but it's also- John, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, uh, that's a that's a real tension that you've identified, um, and I think that that uh, you know the, so this notion there's certain things that that educators believe there are important for students to learn. There's there's that right like algebra. Everyone needs to learn algebra. Well, why? You know that's not anything you use in your daily life hardly at all. Um, but it's it's this gateway subject to the next subjects which get you into college and all that kind of stuff. But the the um, the extreme of that, the opposite of that, to say that students should just follow their own interests mm. is that's problematic as well, right? So that's like the uh, A.S. Neal Summerhill School, where the kids just lay around and and don't do anything. Like there's no structure whatsoever, and so there's there's needs to be some medium um, uh, ground that you are able to somehow relate student interests to things that are of value, but you need to really think hard about what is of value for students in society. And that depends on what the purpose of what you're trying to accomplish is. Yeah, I, I probably disagree with you that the Summerhill approach is as problematic um, as, as you think it is. It might be interesting to explore that a little bit. Um, because one of the things that we that that uh, that I think we also can say, Kevin, could you point. jump in for a minute just about what the Summerhill approach is? Say a yeah. little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, Summerhill, and then there's another school called Sudbury Valley, which maybe some listeners may be familiar with. But Summerhill is a very kind of libertarian sort of approach where uh, it's a school where there are classes, but they're voluntary, so they're always up to students. Students can attend if they want; they don't have to. Uh, there's other rooms and other things uh, that you can do. There's, you know, a library if you want to go there. There's uh, a kitchen if you want to go there. There's, you know, a room with video games, et cetera, if you want to go there. And students can kind of take charge of, of their time. And you do see, you know, uh, to John's point, you do see students doing things at the school that don't look like they're terribly productive. Um, but I think that the folks at, at Summerhill and Sudbury Valley and stuff would, would argue, well, I, I think there's two things you could argue here. First, is it more productive to teach students things they don't care about that we pretty well know that they're going to forget than it is to allow them to not learn those things and do what it is they want to do? And second of all, um, I, I actually know people who run similar schools like this. Jim Reitmulder runs the Circle School. And one of the things he says is oftentimes kids need a certain amount of time to do nothing in order to stumble across things they care about 
enough to learn them. And once they stumble across those things, the learning is rapid. But if you force the learning before they care about those things and before you've given them time to figure out what it is they want to focus on, um, the learning is usually going to be pretty subpar. So then it's a question of, is it better to give them subpar learning than to allow them the time to stumble across things? Meredith, what are what are your thoughts about this? You know, we've had a lot of sort of comments also in the in the chat. Just you know, well, what actually happens if we let kids um, have that autonomy about their learning? Um, what what do we know from learning in small scale societies that might be relevant to this issue? Well, in small scale societies, they're learning everything in their environment and what they need to survive and how to bring up other kids. But what strikes me and what, what everyone is talking about is that in my mind, part of the point of school is something simply called exposure. How do you know what you'll be interested in if you never run across it? Mm -hmm. I never heard the word anthropology in, until I was in college. I had no idea it existed. So who knew that would turn out to be my thing? And I think something I appreciated from my own parents, even though they had a bunch of kids and no money, they w took us to things that they could afford. You know, it, it, if some orchestra was playing and it was free, we would go. And so I think school is also a place where kids get exposed to things that may turn out to be important, necessary, or just interesting to them. And that's one reason we have them read things that they might object to, because it might turn out to be something good. But this also brings, brings it back to my comment about learning critical thinking and the scientific method. Certainly any kids who are yelling and screaming about, I hate science, I don't want to learn science, they certainly need those skills today. If they were adults or even as kids today to understand why they need to wear a mask, what a germ is, what you do about it, how you control it. And so science education turns out to be fundamental to the way we're operating right now. Actually, I would like to interject there for a little bit because this, there may be another um, potential point of disagreement um, maybe between Meredith and I at this point. First of all, I hear what you're saying, but I hear what you're saying, Meredith, is framing like a school as an ideal, not schools as they are, because we know that kids today, the conspiracy theorists you're talking about are going to schools. They are learning science. Um, so it could be that, that the argument is that we need better science instruction, but to say that, that, that um, science instruction is, is sort of sufficient for those things. Uh, it sounds like you're talking about schools as they should be in ideal theory rather than schools as they are well that you may be right i mean i don't i don't work in the area of education today so i don't know you know exactly what's going on but my impression just from reading the newspaper is that uh the science education in the lower levels is actually subpar compared to europe that i do know and europeans talk about that so while kids may get some let's science training, whatever that might be, I don't think it's up to other cultures. And the people who are interested in believe conspiracy theories don't seem to understand the numbers or let's just take the vaccine, what a clinical trial is and how you can't really argue with the numbers. And so they actually have a particular belief system that cannot be broached. You cannot change their mind. And maybe if when they were younger, they were exposed to different belief systems, including critical thinking and science, maybe they wouldn't turn out that way. So I, I think my opinion is, and I don't even know if it's well-based, is that yes, we have some science education in this country, but in general, it's not very good uh, across the nation is what I'm referring to. This is, John, a, this is John's John, wheelhouse. So. Yeah, John, what yeah. are your thoughts here? Yeah, I, I, a, a couple of things. One is I, I agree with Meredith that, that science education generally is not very good. I, but the reason it's not very good is because it focuses on just sort of content knowledge. Like people are just learning the science content because that's what the standardized tests uh, measure. Um, that's what gets students there, you know, into the AP classes and, and the score on their AP tests and whatnot. I don't know that European science education is much better. I mean, I think that that generally the levels of sort of understanding of the nature of science and science worldwide is is low. 
but I, I don't I don't think either that um, having students learn the scientific method, I mean, that's hugely problematic because for one, there is no single scientific method. Right. Um, there's a whole bunch of different practices that different communities of scientists engage in. Um, and and that's science works in a, in a sort of multitude of different ways. But the way people make decisions isn't like, I'm gonna take the vaccine because I understand how a clinical trial is is mm -hmm. constructed. Mm -hmm. People decide to, to do things because of other people in their community who do things and because they trust those people in their communities mm -hmm. or the authority mm -hmm. figures, right? Mm -hmm. And so building trust in, in expertise is a, a more uh, desirable goal, I think, than trying to teach some mm -hmm. notion of a scientific method. Yeah, so can I jump in here. I, uh, I have a question. We, so this year, many parents have been thrown into making their own choices about education. They've, they've had to choose, do I do online? Do I send my kid in a small group to in-person schools? Do I homeschool? Do I do self-directed learning? And they've had to do it in very short time horizons with not much background. Ideally, who should be making these decisions about how school systems work? Is it, should this all be federal? Should, should this be a, a conversation between the all parents in the country and, and the federal government? Should it be more local? What, what's the ideal here? Who, who should be having these conversations that we're having now? Well, I'm a, I'm a big believer that in general, unless there's a really good reason to the contrary, the people who should be making decisions like this are the people who bear the primary cost of those decisions or the primary benefit of those decisions. So in other words, it's not good to remove choice and give it to people who don't bear the costs of making, let's say, a bad choice or bear the benefits of a good choice because they're the people who have the least incentive to make those choices. So in this case, I would say that there's probably a strong reason to, to, to give um, families control and decentralize as much as possible, if not families, localities, make sure that whoever's deciding is as in close a proximity to the people who bear the primary cost or benefit of those decisions, which are the families and the child. Well, so Kevin, let me just jump in here. So that that it, that would go against Meredith's point that yeah. she thought that education in Europe was in some subjects superior. I mean, so the the U.S. is the is the uh, poster child of decentralization, and and European countries have you know the the very top down ministries of education, and and I guess the you know you have a a natural experiment in in whose model is more effective. I mean, you, I guess you could compare those things and see. Sure. It, I mean, the thing that we do know about the top performing countries is they're all very different in terms of who they give the power to. So I think the Netherlands ranks fairly highly in nations and national education, and they, they uh, have a very robust school choice system. China doesn't. Um, so it's, it's, it's much, I think it's, we would have to go much beyond kind of just the dichotomy of Europe as a whole versus the U.S. as a whole. Um, and I think there, I mean, there are countries who are ranked very highly that give either um, a lot of autonomy to parents or a lot of autonomy to to localities. I think, uh, I believe Sweden uh, or Switzerland, I'm sorry, is another country a country that gives a lot more autonomy to localities and they do quite well. So, but you're looking, so speaking of autonomy, so if we're talking about self-directed learning, yeah. you know, is is when you say these these countries rank highly, is that the kind of you know, what's the measure? And is that what we're calling quality education or is that what we're just saying is high standards? Yeah, I mean, I believe, the measure, I believe the measure that all of these uh, countries are using, well, I, I'm forgetting the, the acronym, is it the, is it the, oh geez, the International uh, Reading and Math Tests. I think it's like the, what is it, the NAEP, I believe. I, that, I, I that's a US, that's a US test. So that's a, the, there, there the is NAEP. kind of an international metric that, that, that yeah. they're using to rank these, these schools. And you're right. I mean, there's a question about whether or not that's the best metric. But uh, I mean, if not that, then I would just ask what. Meredith, yeah. what do you think? Who should be making these decisions? Well, it, it's very interesting listening to other uh, to everyone else, because I was thinking about my own background and my own parents. And of course, I, you know, I don't have little kids now uh, myself, but uh, I was one of four and my parents couldn't care, couldn't have cared less about our education. 
They never asked what we were doing in school, what our grades were, nothing. Uh, so I think if they had been called on to make decisions about that, they would have gone, whatever, you know, just make sure she grows up, gets out of the house and gets a job. Um, so my question to, to uh, the other two is, when we see this drop in the birth rate, birth rate, do you find that parents have opinions, strong opinions, weak opinions about what they would like their kids to learn in school? I mean, I, I was just, I was just going to say that that I saw in one of the comments someone was talking about being a helicopter parent, and that seems to be a recent phenomenon. And if you put the decision making power in the hands of the helicopter parents, I think you're going to get sort of the opposite kinds of education that most people think is most desirable, right? It's it's all about scores and and college preparation and and social mobility and uh, and and, the, and that's natural response in a in a in a world where we have increasing income inequality and people are worried about their kids being successful maybe not being happy as much as being successful. Well, then two things. Um, so, you know, Meredith mentioned, you know, your parents didn't really care very much. Um, and that's, I'm sure, not atypical. Um, but I, I suspect that could also be a function of the fact that, you know, the idea is you go to public school, you're paying us, the experts, to educate your kids. Just leave it up to us. And you don't really have a lot of choice in the matter. Um, I, you know, in in all sorts of goods and deliver, deli uh, goods and service delivery systems, we rely on and we acknowledge that it's a good thing that consumers have a choice. And even if we don't trust all consumers to make good choices, I think we generally recognize that the the idea that customers have exit options if something isn't working for them uh, has spillover effects. Like the fact that. I'm sure a lot of people don't really care very much when they go car shopping. They just want the car that looks the best. But the fact that we have, I guess, kind of a competitive system and the fact that we have a system where you can, every producer knows that everyone has options. So you better offer a better option than your competition. Um, I think that generally works out well, even for the parents or even for the people who don't really put a whole lot of uh, gusto into buying cars. And I have to imagine it would be better than uh, a system where the government experts are in charge of, you know, showing you your two options of cars and you just pick one. Mm -hmm. We, go ahead, Meredith. We also have in this culture, I'm going to go back to belief systems, which run our lives, is that in Western culture, especially in North America, our belief system for our children, what guides parenting, most parenting, is wanting our children to grow up to be independent and self-sufficient. And that just guides everything, including education. And that's not true for other cultures where People are not expected to leave home at 18 and support yeah. themselves. They're still part of a, an extended family collective that works together in, in some way. And so we have to layer on top of this. And also when we think about the apocalypse, what will be the belief system then? What will we want? Is it just survival or is it going to be something else? Are we going to incorporate independence mm -hmm. and self-reliance? We want these kids to be able to run down that gazelle and kill it. You know, is that what's going to be important then? It's I, I think it, this it, is it's like that that led me to. I told Meredith before the show, I, I, if she notices her royalties going up for her books, because I because I bought like three of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate those points. Yeah, I think this also just you know brings us back to the the sort of fundamental question of you know what is the the point of education, um, and even if we're thinking about it in you know a Western context, if the point is you know economic competitiveness, but you know we have such increasing income inequality, um, you know do we need to be sort of just rethinking all of these models of you know what the what the end goal is for what students should look like when they're done with their formal education. Um, should we be thinking more about, you know, the social embeddedness? Should we be thinking more about, you know, well, what are the the actual skills that they need, not just to, you know, get a job and make money, but to to deal with being in a world that is changing as quickly as it is, and where, you know, there's wicked problems that need to be solved. I, I think it's it's interesting that we could actually run uh, uh, 
I don't know, uh, with interviews or something, uh, some kind of study, because there has been a generational change. When I went to college, I never once thought about what job I would get. Uh, one of my students said, why did you do anthropology? I'm like, mm. they go, you're never going to make a living doing that. And I said, well, I never thought about it. I was just trying to help stop a war. You know, that's basically while I was in college. And then I saw with my daughter's friends and with my daughter that they're one of their primary uh, uh, reasons for going to college and getting an education is to support themselves and a family. And they, they feel the heavy pressure of the economic situation that I think people my age did not feel. And so interviews between these two generations, I think would be really interesting because the, the purpose of education has changed dramatically in the last 50 years or 25 years. Yeah, I'm Kevin. trying to think. Uh, I'm I'm trying to think about there's um there's I know a study or two that I read on unschoolers. Um, I believe one of them was authored by Peter Gray and Gina Riley, who I'm working on a study with now. Uh, but it may not have been this study. But there was one or two that I've read that look at where unschoolers are now. So once you know you go through this process of twelve plus years of not doing formal curriculum, where are you now? And on on the quote unquote bad news side, they noticed. Um, that there are a fair number of unschoolers who are working at jobs that that don't arguably pay as well as the jobs that you know you you could get in kind of the corporate world or whatever. But then on the positive, when you look at how they rate their life satisfaction, it's rated very high. So the obvious explanation that you would come to is that unschoolers get hooked from the first on intrinsic motivation. They find something or things that they like to do. They devote most of their time to those things. And they say, I'm going to get a job in that thing. And I don't really care that much whether it pays me a lot of money because I could go and get a job that makes me a lot of money, but it's not going to be as fun as this job. And I really like the what I get to do in this job. So when you look at you know why they chose the career they did, what they say about their life satisfaction, it's I get to do stuff I love. Um, and I don't know if, I don't think that was compared to public school, uh, like a control group. So I don't know if the public school crowd would have said the same thing. Uh, but it was just a really interesting thought when I saw those results. I think, Kevin, that, that gets back to Meredith's point about when she was younger, she didn't feel those pressures. She, it, because we had, it was a different world that we lived in where, where the government fully, invet, not fully, but uh, could, devoted considerable resources to supporting schools, to supporting colleges and universities, providing opportunities for people and and the and the job landscape and the kinds of things people could do were much more um, opportunities. So you didn't have to worry as much. And maybe you could spend more time being an anthropology major or a philosophy major because you're going to be okay in, in that society back there in the in the in the 1970s and things. I, um, I haven't seen I haven't seen any evidence to show that governments, local, state, federal today spend less per capita than they did in like the. There's been a huge, uh, huge def defunding of universities and colleges at the state level. Well, uh, university be, colleges is a different. I mean, that's a different, arguably a different story. I was talking about K twelve. Well, I mean, I'm talking about the opportunities people had to go to colleges and and universities and and pursue their interests, right? So. Back in the in the in the sixties or the fifties and sixties, tuition was free in, in like the City University of New York and places like that. You know, and and University of Wisconsin was funded. The state funding was eighty six percent. Right now, we're at like thirteen percent state funding, um, and that changes things considerably. I mean, it, it just it, it does. And and of course, through I mean, you know, throughout the last several decades, it was more possible not to go to college and have a viable career than it is today. So not only has college education risen in cost, but it's become a bottleneck, mm -hmm. uh, much more of a bottleneck to the professional world th that it has before. I definitely agree with you on that. And, um, and, and I also know that uh, uh, kids my daughter's age are very aware of how few jobs there are out there. And when I was young, it never occurred to me that I couldn't get a job because I had already been working. I started working at 15 and I just, I always knew I would support myself. I knew that I had to because my family couldn't. 
And it never was such a big thing. But keep in mind at that time that nobody had health insurance either. You just went to the doctor. Right. So on top of this, and now companies or places you work for don't give pensions. I have no pension from Cornell. So there, there's a big difference yeah. economically that are facing people who are in their 20s now who are thinking about what is my life going to be like when I'm 40? It's not going to be as good as my parents because the economics of the entire system have changed. So are, are there countries or, or I mean, even regions that are radically rethinking education in, in light of uh, the, the current realities of the world? I know, I know that the Netherlands is an example um, that I think is really interesting because they have a very well supported nation, nationally funded system of education, but their system allows for a, a wide variety of school choice. I had a student a year ago come into our college of education as an exchange student from the Netherlands. And she had trouble understanding why school choice was such a contentious, contentious and partisan issue in the United States, because it's just, it's just a fact of life there. And what was really interesting was we did a reading on the Sudbury Valley school that I talked about earlier that gives the kids a lot of freedom. And I was asking her periodically, like, do you, to make sure she could relate to these readings, because most of the readings were U S centric. And she said about the Sudbury reading, that's the first reading where I read it. And I, I, I like recognize, like, I know schools like that. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting. And I asked her, are they, are they funded by the state? And she said, yes, they're funded by the state. Mm -hmm. um, so at least in terms of offering a, a wide variety of options coupled together with the equity that you would have from a, a well-funded kind of government system, I think the Netherlands is a really interesting example. So we're coming up to our last few minutes. Um, I want to offer each of you a, a chance to give some final thoughts. Um, so um, let's start with you, John. Anything um, take home messages that um, you think people should know about educating kids in the apocalypse or um, even, you know, less extreme challenges that uh, they may be facing? Yeah, I get. I, I'll do the less extreme challenges. I, 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 you know, this, this, the, the paleo traditional dichotomy that people were talking about. I mean, I, I think that the it's hard to know um, what that means exactly. If the traditional means sort of the the current model of schooling where kids are are marched through the grades and and standardized tests to death and and are gathering credentials that they can exchange for uh, mobility on the socioeconomic ladder. I think that's not the direction we want to go. I think we want to have opportunities for self-directed, meaningful learning. I mean, that's where real learning actually occurs. Um, but I think that the, we need to think about what the purpose of that is. And, and right now, for me, I, the thing that I'm most focused on, um, in fact, I'm working on, a, I'm on sabbatical right now, writing a book, and it's called Why We Teach Science and Why We Should. And, and it's not about economic development and, and global competition. It's about sort of democratic participation and understanding how um, our complex society works and the role of science in it. And, and it's that kind of understanding that I think students need to come away with to, to be able to collectively solve the problems that are challenging us. Thanks, John. How about you, Kevin? Um, paleo school, public school, some combination. What What are your thoughts for how we move forward? I think it's different for different kids. But the problem with the uh, kind of the the conventional model we have now is that when kids decide that it doesn't work for them, no one believes them, and they we you have to go through this model. Like I have a five year old who kind of wants to go to school, so we have a Montessori charter school that we're signing them up for, with the understanding that. You can go to school, absolutely. But, you know, when you go, you have to do what they're telling you to do. And if you ever decide that it's not worth it, we'll talk through it and, and we'll, you know, we'll pull you out and figure out what does work. Um, I guess my final thought is that, you know, we live in a very different knowledge economy than the knowledge economy that schools were designed for and the knowledge economy that even existed 30 years ago. Uh, it's become a lot easier because information is less scarce to learn things in some ways when you need them. Uh, a potential downside is that the pace of change has accelerated in terms of what you need to know. Um, so I would argue that the education that we need, uh, if we want to think about any particular things that we need to know, that everyone needs to know, 
it's really the skill of how to learn. And I don't think at the end of the day, the public system we have today does a good job with that because it's a place that tells you this is a separate place apart from everything else where you're going to learn stuff and you better learn it now because once you're go once you're done, you, you missed your shot. So you better learn it now. And that's just, I don't think that's the, the message we want to send kids in the 21st century information economy. That makes a lot of sense. And also, you know, there's so much that you can learn easily now if you know how to find the right information through the internet, right? But you have to have that ability to know how to learn from that fire hose of information. Yeah. Meredith, what are your final thoughts? Well, I like the uh, paleo education, of course. I think that's great. But I think that uh, education in, in the United States needs to absorb the crisis of economics and how that affects the future of our growing citizens and the effect of the internet on education and learning. It's even difficult with college students to explain to them that Wikipedia is not an appropriate reference. So that what Kevin was talking about, how to learn along with critical thinking, I think it would be great if our kids got more of that. Great. Thank you, Meredith. Um, it was amazing having all of you here on the show with us. Um, thank you so much, Meredith and, um, and Kevin and John. Thanks so much for being with us. And um, unfortunately, we are at time now, Rob. Uh, this was an amazing episode. I have to say I have so much to think about now in terms of, you know, not just my own um, kids and their education, but you know what what are we doing um, in the whole educational enterprise, and what should we be doing differently? What can we be doing better to really um, be teaching you know students how to learn and um, how to continue to sort of be flexible and grow and and change um, as the world is is changing all around us? No, I, I agree, and I really came away with this question of what are the things we need to teach students for this new and changing world and how do we identify them and who's having those conversations? And uh, yeah, I wish we were on a dinner table. We could talk a few more hours. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Rob. Um, thank you to all of our guests and thank you all for joining us for today's show. Um, we've made some friends on the other side today uh, and I hope that, that you have too. But it seems so logical I can't deny that there is something supernatural with you Makes me happy